When it comes to rental real estate, you kind of have one last year in strategy and that's the cost segregation, mm -hmm. but you're creating a loss on the returns to be able to utilize the loss. And if you don't qualify as a real estate professional, which means you can't show the IRS you're spending 750 hours in the year managing your investment property, then your only option might be short-term rentals. So if you're a high net W-2 taxpayer, or maybe you have an LLC or an S corporation that's really profitable, you can buy a short-term rental property with the time you have left in the year, manage that property for a hundred hours and more than any other person, such as your cleaning lady. And then just make sure that you're renting it out on average seven days or less per customer. And you would be able to use real estate losses to offset your W-2 and your 1099 income. And this gets positioned a taxpayer to really save some money. All right, guys, welcome to another episode of The Report, Saturday edition. And I got my co-host today, Mr. Carlton Dennis. Carlton, welcome to the show, man. Thank you so much for having me on, man. It's a pleasure to be on. Yeah, I appreciate you taking the drive down from uh, Orange County. Uh, I didn't realize you were in Newport Beach, dude, this whole time. Uh, we've been connecting on social. I thought you were out of state for whatever reason. I'm in your backyard, man. I know. We should have linked up way sooner. I know. And I'm from San Clemente, so I'm up there all the time, but we'll definitely have to, uh, to connect. We know a lot of the, the same people. Yeah, we have to, bro. Yes. You got to come down and have some sushi. Yeah, I'm down. <laughs> it's one of my favorite things, dude. Yeah? Yeah, one of my favorite things. But uh, anyway, so uh, with us winding down to the end of the calendar year, you know, a lot of people have tax bills and that sort of thing. And people are asking, how can I save on income taxes? How can I take advantage of, of some of the real estate tax benefits that are out there? Yeah. Um, and as we're nearing the end of the year, it's not too late to jump in and, and buy a property, get a cost seg study. Um, but wanted to ask you, yeah. um, you know, what types of people out there should be buying a, a rental property here before the end of the year and getting cost seg study? Yeah. When it comes to rental real estate, you kind of have one last year in strategy and that's the cost segregation, mm -hmm. but you're creating a loss on the returns to be able to utilize the loss. And if you don't qualify as a real estate professional, which means you can't show the IRS you're spending 750 hours in the year managing your investment property, then your only option might be short-term rentals. So if you're a high net W-2 taxpayer, or maybe you have an LLC or an S corporation that's really profitable, you can buy a short-term rental property with the time you have left in the year, manage that property for a hundred hours and more than any other person, such as your cleaning lady. And then just make sure that you're renting it out on average seven days or less per customer. And you would be able to use real estate losses to offset your W-2 and your 1099 income. And this gets positioned a taxpayer to really save some money. Yeah, I think the STR loophole is, is one of the most powerful uh, tax strategies out there in the real estate space, especially for the high income earning uh, W-2 folks out there. Uh, let me ask you this. How many days in service do you need to have that short term rental uh, up and running to qualify for this? So typically we like to recommend that if you're a real estate investor, we want you to get over 14 days because the IRS does have this 14 day rule, which means if you're renting out a property to another party for 14 days or less, technically the rental income is non-taxable. But if you rent out the property for 15 days, now it's actually considered a rental property and you have to pay taxes on the rental income, which is totally fine because you're going to be able to now finally take depreciation. So one of the strategies that I teach people to do is the 771 strategy. What's that? That's where you have your first customer stay in the property for seven days. You have your second customer stay in the property for seven days and you have your third customer stay in the property for one days. That way you have a total of 15 rental days and on average you've rented out the property seven days or less in the year. Gotcha. Okay. So um, that is a pretty interesting strategy right there. So, you know, I'm actually onboarding a couple properties right now. We are renovating a 24 unit boutique hotel here in the neighborhood. We are about to launch that here by the end of the month. Nice. Um, so we'll have plenty of runway there. But this other property I'm renovating right now, we are like in the final stages as well. It's going to be a short term rental. Yeah. And uh, it's also here in this neighborhood. So I think that one, we just got to make sure that we're live and up and running. I would say probably by the second week of December, just to be safe. Would you agree? I would 100% agree. But the yeah. benefit that you have, Rich, is that you can make a grouping election on the tax return. So even though your other property is not rented out yet, you can group it into one passive activity. Mm -hmm. And that allows for you to perform cost segregation studies on the property that is rented and on the property that's not rented and be able to use the real estate losses in total. Can you explain how that works again? So you talked about grouping these properties together. What do you mean exactly? Yeah. So the IRS created this rule called uh, a grouping election. And the reason why they did this is because if you're somebody that's in the real estate space, which you are, the IRS realizes that you may not be able to spend 750 hours managing 
each one of your properties. So what they allow for you to do is qualify to manage one property for either 750 hours, if you're gonna be a real estate professional, or 100 hours if you're running the short-term rental rule, and you can use that 100 hours or 750 as treated as if you managed all of your properties in your portfolio. So as tax professionals, we can make a grouping election that groups these properties all into one bucket. And that allows for us to perform cost segregation studies and benefit from all of the properties on the tax return. I love that. Um, what exactly is a cost seg study? So we throw, we throw the term out there all the time. Yeah. And I know like the basis of what it does, right? It's a way to, you know, uh, really supercharge the depreciation that you can take from a property. And I see these reports come back and they're always like, oh, like, does this work? And I'm like, hey, what are the chances you could get a little bit more aggressive with some of these numbers? And then they'll send another one and it will be juiced up even more. I'm like, okay, yeah. that looks better. And so I know what it does, but like, what exactly is a cost seg study? Yeah, I like to break down the word cost segregation study. What you're essentially doing is you're getting the cost of all the components that make up a property, a building. This could be flooring, lighting, windows, nuts, bolts, screws, HVAC, the roof, the drywall. And once you have all of these different components segregated, you can perform a study on it to determine the cost of those components. The IRS has already created buckets for everything that you can possibly think of in a rental property. Five-year bucket is for countertops. A seven-year bucket is for windows and appliances. So they know how much value each thing has. By performing a cost segregation study, you're choosing to write these components off in a quicker amount of time, over five, seven, 10, or 15 years. Most taxpayers like you, Rich, will also do bonus depreciation. That allows for you to take all the five, seven, and 10-year components and write that off in one year, creating a big loss on the tax returns. And that loss can offset your W-2 and your 1099 income if you qualify. I love that. And so for the folks out there that are looking to get a short-term rental before the end of this calendar year, how long do they have to do the cost seg study? Because I believe you can do it the following year, right? Yes. One of the only strategies that you can leverage heading into the next year is the cost segregation study. If you qualify this year as a real estate professional or you ran the short-term rental loophole, you would be able to benefit from a cost segregation study up until you file the tax return. So if you are filing your tax return by April 15th, you can do a cost segregation study April 14th and include it into your tax returns. If you're on extension, that means you have all the way until October 15th to be able to include a cost segregation study. So a question about, let's say that someone that's listening right now bought a property in 2019 yeah. and they're like, hey, you know, I need some more depreciation to offset some of my W-2 income. I'm going to convert one of these properties from 2019 that's been a long-term rental or maybe it's been my primary residence into an STR before the end of the calendar year. Can they do that and get a cost seg study? You can do that. The only thing that I will say is when you are trying to qualify for an STR strategy, the IRS does state that your tenants need to stay in the property on average seven days or less. For the calendar year. For the entire calendar now, what if it's year. primary residence and then you're just like, hey, I'm going to move out for the final six weeks of the year. That also will not work. And the reason why is because the IRS created what's called a personal use test, which okay. means if you lived in your property for more than 10% of personal time in the calendar year of rental days, then you won't be able to use that property for depreciation purposes to offset your ordinary income. Gotcha. Okay. So it really needs to be a new acquisition unless for whatever reason that property was just sitting vacant the entire year. Yep. Or if you have an ADU, right? Okay. Maybe oh. you decide to build an accessory dwelling unit in the back of your primary residence. Well, now we have a property that's never been rented out that we can choose to leverage as an STR. We can perform the cost segregation study, be able to write off all that depreciation cost. And now we can create a loss on the returns. So question for you. So let's just say that you have a primary residence, let's say it's called a three bedroom primary, a uh, single family home in the back, you have a one bedroom ADU. Yeah. That ADU has been vacant all year. Um, and let's say you want to operate as an STR. Yes. Is it a percentage of the entire property that you'll be able to allocate um, the bonus depreciation or is it nothing because you're living on the property? Like how does, how does that break down? It is broken down by percentage. So okay. let's just say the front of the house is 50% and the back of the house is the other 50% and the back of the house is what I'm doing as a rental property. That back of the house would be considered in business use the date that I decide to list it on Airbnb or VRBO or put it on Trulia or Redfin, right? So that's when I get to actually take depreciation on the property. If I decide to do a cost segregation study, that allows for me to boost the depreciation on that percentage. I love that. So for the folks out there looking for some tax advantages, they have high paying W-2 careers um, and they don't qualify for professional real estate status. Really, the STR loophole is the best way to do it. You still got a little bit of time to get out there and buy the property and, and bring it online. Now, for the folks out there that 
um, let's say qualify for a professional real estate status. Maybe yeah. they're a full-time real estate agent yeah. and they've had a ton of commissions this year and they're like, Hey, I just want to, um, you know, figure out a way to, you know, defer some of those taxes. Can those folks go and buy a long-term rental or does it need to be an STR? Those folks are in a different situation than any other taxpayer. And the reason why is because the IRS back in 1987 defined 11 real property trader businesses in our terms, real careers that you mm -hmm. can go into that allow for you to count the time as material participation or real estate professional status. So if you're a real estate broker, if you're a wholesaler, if you're a leaser, a flipper, the time that you spend in your business actually qualifies you as a real estate professional. So if you spent time in your business, 500, 750 hours, and then you decide to buy an investment property and you manage it yourself, you can perform a cost segregation study, even if it's a long-term rental. Wow. Okay. Um, cause I feel like a lot of agents out there, they don't even realize that they can take advantage of this. Like I would say 99% of them and their brokers don't do a good job of educating them yeah. uh, that they can do this. Um, and to take it a step further, uh, folks out there that have high paying W-2s, they can go marry someone that qualifies for professional real estate status. They can go marry a real estate agent out there and whatever real estate they buy together, they can use to offset not only their spouse's W-2 income or their, their <clears throat> real estate income, but your W-2 income as well. That's a powerful thing. Rich, that's one of my favorite strategies. If you're listening to this right now and you're married and you're having a child you can have your wife qualify as a real estate professional. If she's not working a W-2 job, make her the real estate professional. She's gonna be the manager over the investment portfolio. She will qualify to get the 750 hours and that will be able to offset your W-2 income if you guys are filing a joint tax return. Maybe the roles are, re are reversed. Maybe the husband's the one that's not working and the wife's the one that's bringing home the money. Well, qualify the husband to be the real estate professional. Have him set up the LLC that manages the investment portfolio, right? Mm -hmm. Now we're showing the IRS that we are true running a real estate operation and we'll be able to perform the cost segregation study. Dude, I, I love that. That's a powerful thing, man. Well, uh, I think for the listeners out there, the main takeaway is, hey, the calendar year is not over. Um, so if you are, if you do qualify for professional real estate status, you have a lot of options out there. If you don't, maybe your spouse is a real estate agent. If not, um, you know, go out there and, and look at an STR property. Absolutely. You can close on something pretty quickly. Um, you know, we're closing on a deal right now up north. Um, and we're gonna probably wrap that deal up in a couple of weeks. And so there's still time in the year. You just need what, 14 days or 15 days? On I would operation. say you would wanna get to 15 days of your property being rented out. And you just wanna mm -hmm. make sure that you have on average seven days or less. This will limit the scrutiny from the IRS of you showing that you were truly running a short-term rental business. There it is. Well, with that, that concludes our Saturday edition episode. He's Carlton Dennis, I'm Rich Summers. Listeners, thanks for tuning in. We'll see you in the next one. Peace. <laughs>